forward. So kids, come on up. Kids of all ages are welcome. Even kids from Germany, if you want to come, you're, you're welcome to come. You don't have to. <laughs> Just mess with you. So come on up. Good to see all you guys. Did you have a nice Christmas? Yeah. Yes. I'm happy to hear that. That's great. Well, I had a great Christmas. And just like all of you, one day when you're adults, I did the right thing, and on Christmas, I went to go see my mom. And I traveled to Chicago, and while we waited for my siblings, who uh, were not there yet, to arrive, Marie and I did some sightseeing. You guys ever do sightseeing, where you kind of drive around and look at stuff, yeah? Well, this is one of the things that we were looking for. Can we see the first slide, please? Now, that is Pirate's Cove Adventure Golf, the place where I first learned that I was going to marry Maria. Everybody say, aww. <laughs> no, it was terrible. I went to go find it. What did I find? An empty lot. It had gone out of business. They wiped it down, and there was absolutely nothing left. This is going to be better. I'm OK. And so on our quest to do some sightseeing, we traveled different places, and we found some other things. What did we find? The Dairy Queen. Do you guys like ice cream? Yeah. That is the Dairy Queen where Marie and I went on our first date and we had some ice cream. What else did we find when we were sightseeing? <gasps> the Aurelios where Maria and I had our first kiss. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> it's healthy for your parents to kiss, Marissa. <laughs> but we went some sightseeing, we saw this, and, and then I went looking for this place. Now that's Borders Books and Music where I worked when Marie and I were dating and I was so excited to buy some Christmas CDs because she loves Christmas CDs. And what did we find? It had gone out of business! And now it's a Whole Foods. And so I went in there anyway and I bought some really expensive milk. <laughs> I just need to say it didn't taste any better when it was so expensive. But here's the thing. As I was driving around some of the old places that Marie and I used to hang out when, when we were younger, I couldn't but be surprised at how much money and how much time people invest in some of these businesses. It's almost like some of these restaurants and businesses around where, where we grew up become people's idol. Do you guys know what an idol is? Can you raise your hand? What's an idol? Something that you worship other than God, that's right. And I know sometimes it's hard for us in our modern world to, to believe, but, but sometimes having too much ice cream oh, can be an idol. Maybe playing too much miniature golf can become an idol. And yes, even too much deep dish Chicago style pizza can become an idol in our lives. And what we're going to see in today's passage is that Paul is walking around ancient Athens and he's doing some sightseeing like I did. And he sees that there's so many idols that people are worshiping it makes him sick to his stomach because he recognized that there's only one true God and only one Lord who deserves all of our attention and not many of the idols that we see in our world today. So good job listening. Thanks for going on a little trip down memory lane with me. It was good to see those things, even if some of the things are not there anymore. Definitely puts things in perspective. So please take a piece of candy before you return your seats. If you are preschool through first grade, with your parents' permission, you can go with Miss Renee to rest up. While the kids are getting situated, please open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. That's where we're going to be today. The book of Acts. Chapter 17. Well, I do hope that you had a great holiday. Um, I had a great time with family back in Chicago. But again, as we drove around, I was just taken aback by the amount of businesses and the types of businesses found in some of the places that Marie and I used to hang out in. And I do think that there's quite a bit of idolatry that goes on in our society. And it's not just on the west side of the Chicago area. But I think our North American culture is full of idols. And so I agree with what Maria had presented in the announcements. I think one way to combat idolatry is to get into God's Word. And so we have the Discipleship Journal. I mean, if you use the Today, which is another good one. Can we put this up there, please, Jim? Uh, again, I, I'm excited to go to January with you, working through this particular devotion. Because again, in order for us to get rid of some of those idols, we need to make sure that we focus on God's Word. And so we're going to get back to some of the basics, the foundations of the Christian faith. But before we get into that in January, we need to do some housekeeping. We need to clean the house of our lives and of our bodies and of our minds and discern if maybe there's some idols in our life that have been distracting us in this past year. 
And so I am really excited about this particular passage. It's one of my favorites because it really demonstrates not only the dangers of idolatry, but how you and I, being followers of the one true God in Jesus Christ, could stand against some of the idols that tear people up and just really surround their lives with such despair because no matter what we do, no matter what idols we have, they're never going to provide us with the fulfillment and the joy that comes from our Lord. And so today's passage takes place in the ancient city of Athens. Can we see that first slide? So this is one of the idols that Paul might have seen as he walked around Athens. This is the goddess of Athena. And so we also have another statue here. We have the god Poseidon. And so as you look at those statues and you think about the different temples that those were located in, you might think, as you did some sightseeing in ancient Athens, you'd be impressed. Maybe you'd be, wow, look at the, the craftsmanship that took to make some of those statues. For Paul, he got sick to his stomach because he realized that the people of Athens were putting all this time, all this energy, all this money and resources into lifeless statues. And he, being a follower of the one true God in Jesus Christ, was able to give them a different way to live by describing who the one true God is. And so keep that in mind as we look at this passage, starting with verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, and that would be Timothy and Silas, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they looked at him and they brought him, or took him, and they brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now, what you worship is something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in the temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day where he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. But when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, well, we want to hear you again on this subject. And that Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And so you can imagine for a moment, there Paul is killing time, waiting for his traveling companions to arrive so that he can be in ministry. And as he's wandering around, he's doing some sightseeing, kind of like how Maria and I did in Chicago, looking at the different things, taking it all in. And as he walked around, as I said, you might think that he was impressed with the different statues, with the architecture and the different things and the culture around him. But instead, 
something inside of him started to twist, and his, his stomach began to get knots in it, and became greatly distressed. Because he knows that there's only one true God, and yet he saw that if people wanted their crops to grow, they would go to this temple with this idol and do this offering. Or if they wanted to have children, then they'd go to this temple and this idol and do this. Or if they wanted to be wealthy, they'd go to this temple. And so they were spending all their time, they were spending all their money, they were spending all these resources on nothing. These lifeless statues that had gripped the city of Athens to the point where people, this is all they knew. And so it greatly distressed him. And so following his usual strategy, he started off with a small group within the Jewish community and the God-fearing Jews in the synagogue. And then he took it outside to the open-air market. So it wasn't like he was in a building for very long. It would be like for me to stand on the corner, right in front of the Walmart or the family fair, and as people come out with their big screen TVs from Walmart, I could say, hey, TV can be an idol. Oh. What are you talking about? TV could be an idol. We just got this for Christmas. It's a 79-inch widescreen plasma 3D surround sound something or other. And so when I was thinking about this, and I was looking at this, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, the same sorts of idolatry, maybe it's in a little different form, but that were also evident not only in our time, but also back then. And so Luke reports in verse 18, that a group of Epicurean Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Maybe when you were in college, you took a little class called philosophy. So let's look at the Epicurean philosophers this morning. Oh, there is Mars Hill. Thank you. I forgot about that. You could skip it. It's a beautiful picture, but we're not there, right? For the Epicurean philosophers, okay, the chief goal, so this is their belief system, in life is to attain the maximum amount of pleasure and the minimum amount of pain. Doesn't it? That kind of sound like our world, right? And so that reminded me of a magazine that came out. You see this one? And uh, the forum is a magazine that my seminary puts out once a quarter. This is from fall, and it's up on the screen. So we have Wall Street. We have a sporting event. <sighs> we need to make sure that there's no idols here at the church this morning. Aaron Rodgers can be an idol, dear. <laughs> Not Jordy Nelson. Good Christian man, I know. But there we have weightlifting and a boat. We have some cheeseburgers and we, we have them all. And again, that's where kind of Marie were, and I were when we were driving around Chicago. And so in this particular issue of the forum, one of my professors, John Cooper, talks about the culture that we live in and how our idol is pleasure. This is what he writes. Our culture worships many idols. Most of us want our idols to make us feel good. So perhaps our greatest idol is pleasure or enjoyment. A technical term for this way of life is hedonism. And I think this is what Paul was wrestling with back in Athens. And so Cooper goes on to explain, by bending all of life toward pleasure, hedonism imperils human welfare by undermining the divinely designated benefits of marriage, family, education, the economy, justice, morality, and religion. Hedonism is not a sustainable lifestyle. It consumes more than it produces. It lives off the work and the wealth of other people and previous generations, and it fails to maintain a sound natural, social, economic, moral, and spiritual environment for future generations. And so that's what Paul was wrestling with. The same sorts of idolatry that were in the ancient world, this Epicurean philosophy about pleasure, has taken a hold of our modern culture. And back then, Paul recognized how dangerous this was, recognized how destructive it could be. And so he begins to talk about the one true God. And when they first hear about it, they say, what is this babbler trying to say? And when they use the word babbler, if you were a philosophy major in the world and that was your thing, you would be really offended because what they were saying was a, a picker, and not a nose picker, not a nose picker. But in Greek there for babbler, it's seed picker. In other words, that they accuse Paul of just picking little ideas from this philosophy and that philosophy and trying to pursue, produce it as his, his own idea. And so they were criticizing him. And still others, right, 
remarked that he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And so what they thought Paul was trying to do is so you got this guy, you got this guy, you got this guy, then you got this guy. And so they thought Paul was bringing his God to make sure that they could build a temple to that particular God. And Luke points out, they said this because Paul was preaching the good news, right? Last week, last Sunday, we talked about the good news that you and God need so about Jesus and the resurrection. And so they thought for sure Paul was going to present this new God that they had never heard. I mean, we know this new teaching that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas, and we want to know what they mean. And then Luke adds like a parenthetical statement in verse 21, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about it, listening to the latest ideas. Doesn't that sound like a great job, right? That you would get paid to sit around all day and just talk about ideas? All day, every day. But this was the culture of Athens. They wanted to know about this new idea. So they invited him to this very important place on Mars Hill. Now, isn't that the picture there? We see the picture? I went out of order. Can you throw that picture up again? Awesome. My fault. It was not Joan's fault. I take full responsibility for being out of order. So then they went to what's called the Areopagus on Mars Hill. And so you could see the sloping of the rocks there. It was sort of a natural amphitheater. And so they invited Paul to speak at this very important place with all these very important people that were the keepers of the culture. So in our world, this would be like celebrities, or this would be politicians that steer culture to their whim. And so again, Paul gets up there and he speaks, and he points out that, you know what, men of Athens, I see that in every way, you are very religious. And then he goes on and he points out to say, no, 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 you're not really religious, you're more superstitious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at all the objects of worship, I even formed an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Because for the people of Athens, if they're sick, they go to this God. If they want good crops, they go to this God. They want to make sure they didn't miss any of the gods, and so they knew they couldn't have them all. So they have this one listed to an unknown God. And so Paul says, now you worship something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you the one God that they worship without knowing, this one altar and statue, was now going to be revealed to them. And so Paul does what most good apologetics do. They start with creation. We did that on Christmas Eve, right? Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. But then if you look again at verse 27, God did, created the world and allowed us to live in it so that men would seek Him and perhaps reach out and find Him. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. It happened to us a couple months ago that it's late at night and the power goes out, right? So we have night lights for our kids and stuff. And when the power goes out, you're kind of like fumbling through and you're tripping over things and you're, you're looking for maybe a flashlight or a candle and, and then you light the candle and you burn yourself and you drop it. Oh, man, where's the flashlight, right? And so Paul knows the culture of Athens so well that when he uses that phrase, reaching out or feeling around, it's the same Greek word that a writer named Homer, many of you had to read Homer, uses to describe how Odysseus blinded a giant one-eyed monster. You guys remember what the giant one-eyed, you were in the first service. Isn't that or something? Yeah, and he had one big what? I remember what his, he was the Cyclops, that's right. And so Paul knew that story and he uses that same word. And so all the Cyclops could do would be feeling around to try and get his way out. And so if we could see the slide here, this concept of humanity reaching out for God is important for two reasons. First, in our sin, even if we are blind as Cyclops, since creation is all around us, we are obligated to feel after God and find Him, even though we can't see Him. And again, we believe that fallen humanity is incapable of understanding God unless He first opens up the spiritual eyes of our heart. But generally the problem is not in the nature of our reasoning or explanation, but rather the rebellion of the human heart. The problem is the hearers. Paul declares who God is and what he has done and allows him to bless the declaration. What happens is that God takes the truth of his word by the power of the Holy Spirit, carries it to the heart, and brings conviction. So I want to point out one other thing. Not only does Paul use this phrase to get them thinking about this blind cyclops from mythology, but he actually quotes two lines from Greek poetry that would resonate with all the people that are listening to him. One was named Epidemus, and the other one is Eratus. And so using the words of their own poets, Paul uses this to prove his own argument, saying, therefore, since we are God's offspring, 
We should not think that a divine being like gold or silver is man by man's skill. In the past, God overlooked such things, but now he's calling everybody to repent. And notice in verse 31, for he has set the day where he will judge the world with justice by the man. He doesn't use the word Jesus there. He refers to Jesus without using his name, but he's referring to this man that he has appointed. God has given proof of this to all men by raising him, capital H, Jesus, from the dead. And again, without using the name of Jesus, he's explaining the importance of the good news of the gospel. So one last thing that the author of Luke points out as he finishes talking and you've got all these people, some are laughing, a few of them came to be followers of him. And so I would not think, some people said, well, Paul was a failure. He only got two or three followers of Jesus from this conversation. But Luke points out that they were really important people. Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, a number of others as well. So it's clear that these two individuals were people of influence, that these two people were leaders of the community, that the Lord had used Paul by his words to go to the heart and convict them of all of these false idols that they were worshiping were worthless. And instead now that they were going to follow the one true God who they thought they knew, and now they know is the Lord in Christ Jesus. And so I, one of the reasons that I love this particular passage is because I think it gives us all a great example on how we should all be living. We should all be living this countercultural lifestyle that acknowledges what are some of the idols of our world and then work to address it. As Professor Cooper ends his essay here, in a pleasure-obsessed society, Christians ought to live counterculturally. We ought to cultivate lifestyles which truly enjoy the good things that God gives us in ways and proportions that He intends. We can even take pleasure in avoiding the hedonistic excess which tempt us. Empowered by God's Word and Spirit, we can learn to enjoy choices that are motivated by love, justice, stewardship, as well as our own satisfaction. So in this new year, I want you to do something for me. I want you to look back in 2014 and see if there's any idols in your life that you've been elevating in more importance than the Lord. And as you begin this new year this week, as you look forward to what God's going to do in your life in 2015, I want you to ask the Lord to keep you on your guard so that if things in your life once again become more important than Him, that you can immediately recognize that, throw them away, and put things right in your life where He and His Word is the number one priority. Because all that other junk, it never fulfills. It may be good for a little bit, it may seem like it's fulfilling, but in the end, all idols, no matter what they are, are empty and lifeless. Because there's only one true God, and He's the God that we serve. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Your Word, and we're thankful for Paul's example, and how we too should speak into a culture that elevates pleasure above all else. Lord, we thank you for this year and the many blessings that you've poured on in us. And we ask that you do work in our hearts to clean house of any other idols that may hinder us from knowing you, the one true God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
comes with the Holy Spirit, be with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.